Canadian rapper and singer Drake, Elon Musk, the man behind Tesla and SpaceX, Vince Carter, the NBA basketball player, Ken Kutaragi, father of the PlayStation, and Ching Shi, the most successful and prolific pirate in the 1800s. What do all these individuals have in common? They are all disruptors in their industries. In this podcast episode, I sit down with the bold one himself, author and strategist, Sean Kanungo. Hey there, I'm Chris and welcome to This Professional Life, a channel where I share my insights, strategies, and ideas around business development, as well as documenting interesting business stories that inspire my creativity. Space agencies spent decades working on technology to enable spaceflight and exploration, but yet in seven years, SpaceX was able to achieve its first successful orbital launch. How did Ching Shi, a female pirate in the 1800s, nine years after taking over the Pirate Confederation in China, become so powerful that she was able to negotiate a surrender with the Chinese government without any punishment or reparations being imposed on the Pirate Confederation? In The Bold Ones, Sean Kanungo puts these individual stories together and delivers a map that shows you how to replicate the tactics of these individuals and emulate the strategies to create your own disruption, no matter what industry you're in. Now, Sean is a globally recognized strategist, keynote speaker, and partner at Queen & Rook, where he advises organizations and executives on disruptive trends. Previously, he spent 12 years at Deloitte, first as an accountant, and then a management consultant who worked closely with companies on strategy and innovation. Sean was born and raised in my hometown here in Edmonton, and coincidentally, he moved in across from my office last year, so it'd only be fitting to have him on my podcast. We had an amazing conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. Jay Shetty, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, like a lot of people, they're like, uh, so somebody, somebody once came up to me and he was like, this happens actually all the time. They're like, hey, you should look at this video. Like, he's very similar to you. Uh, uh, and and it turns out to be Jay Shetty. Yeah. And a funny story is that like there was a woman. I was at a I was at a conference in Banff, and it was actually a accounting conference in Banff. It was for CPA. I can't remember. And she was like, "Oh, before you were coming on, I got really excited because uh, I thought you were somebody else. And then when you came on, it wasn't him. But you know, the rest of the presentation was good. And that person ended up being Jay Shetty. She th she thought." Yeah. Jay Shetty was going to come on. Right, and then right. she got me. So she was like thoroughly disappointed. But yeah. <laughs> uh, Sean Kanungo. Kanungo, is that I'm yeah. pronouncing that right? Thank you for joining today. Well, I'm Super excited. excited. Yeah. yeah. Dig deep. You're, you've been traveling a lot. How's yes. that been? Well, I've been traveling my entire career. So I, I've actually developed a superpower when it comes to traveling where I'm like a, I'm like a psychopath in the plane. I'm really good at working in the plane, yeah. but you get me to work like in the office or anywhere else, yeah. like I, I can't work. But in the plane, like I am locked in. Like yesterday I came from, uh, I was coming from Toronto uh, down here. I had to like pound away um, at a at a deck for like four hours and I just, just yeah. got it done and I felt amazing. Yeah. And I've done that throughout my career. My best work throughout my entire career has been on a plane. But you built those routines, right? Yes. I... So my previous life, I ran a consulting company helping companies raise capital. And so we would do a lot of roadshows. My business partners, I we would go across Canada, get to know a lot of financial planners. But it was like a hectic travel schedule. I can remember one time I was, uh, I think I was gone the whole week. Yeah. I think I had five cities I was in. And by the last city, I was like, I don't even know where I was. But I knew when I got on the plane... I had it to like, you know, fix the pitch deck. We had to do all these yeah, things, yeah, but you yeah. get into that routine. Totally. And then you get back into the office for the next week and you're like, I don't want to work. <laughs> like, yeah. I was just working so hard over the week. Well, I, I think also like for me, I know like I got three kids, right? Yeah. So when I'm at home, I can't really work when they're around yeah. Um, because, you know, that's what you have to do as a parent. You have yep. to spend time with your kids. So, you know, on the weekends I don't work on the weeknights, you know, when my kids are not, a, when they're awake, you know, I'm not working. Yeah. And so I really have to maximize my time. And so then I find that those plane rides are just like focused time yes. where I can just power in. And, and so I don't mind traveling. Like I don't, like obviously we live in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and we always have to connect. So I went, I was in San Antonio this week. I'm in Tampa Bay on Sunday. Like, and I, but I find those times as amazing times. It just gets stuff done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
do you ever deal with um like jet lag and stuff like that like have you kind of gotten used to that with your busy I, schedule i i um in terms of jet lag i don't get jet lag i don't know why i just uh i just conform to the <laughs> to the to the time Whatever time zone you're yeah, in time yeah. and, the, and the hotel room that i'm in yeah and you know just just manage the you know i've i have had i have like the craziest plane stories um and the delays and the cancellations yeah. and like the, the things that i gotta do like um it's just wild even this month like just the craziest stories but you just you do develop a muscle you say okay something's going wrong yeah like you just figure it out like get on get get another plane drive 10 hours somewhere like you got to figure it out right yeah. just, so just, just make it work just make it work yeah yeah um I want to kind of go into your background. Yeah. Growing up in Edmonton, I feel we're very similar. I'm, you know, immigrant family. I feel the Asian culture. There's like a lot of, you know, similarities in terms of uh, career choice and pressures. I know growing up, uh, I think there were five acceptable career choices for me growing up in my Asian household. You can probably imagine yes. doctor, dentist, lawyer. Dentist. Okay, yeah. yeah. Dentist was like on wow. the... Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah. Okay. yeah, okay. okay. But like, eh. yeah. But yeah, you know, so there was only specific... But I want to learn more about you growing up here in Edmonton, kind of your life, and and then maybe how that has affected or influenced where you're at today. Yeah, no, I listen, Edmonton is the greatest city on the planet. Uh, I believe that the reason why there's so many incredible hard working people coming out of here uh people with incredible work ethic is because um you know we're kind of like in the middle of nowhere in the north here right and you know there, there's something about you know living in minus 35 <laughs> and getting your kids like and strapping them into their car seats uh when it's blistering cold like you gotta just you gotta embrace the suffering yeah, yeah. you gotta embrace the challenge <laughs> um and and nothing is handed to you like mm -hmm. i think if you're in another region if you're in toronto you're in new york wherever it might be like you just have that social network around you and you have things that are around you you have an in infrastructure around you that it's easier and i feel like in edmonton you have to struggle and so we build this grit we build this resilience at the end of the day and so i i, I absolutely credit you know the the fact that uh i'm blessed that i was able to you know be born and raised in this particular city um and you know i love the city i love the people here and my background was just like, it's funny because I, I grew up in Twin Brooks. Like it's like, you know, it's like a middle class, upper class yeah, yeah. neighborhood in uh, in Edmonton. But, you know, my, my friends and I, we, we like lived on the streets. Like we were always constantly, you know, playing street hockey yeah. or baseball or football. Like, and I credit so much of my um, upbringing, just like, just living with like this incredible community of people where we were always outside, which is playing, mm -hmm. just building relationships, understanding how to, you know, deal with other kids. Like it was an incredible experience. Uh, went to the University of Alberta, um, incredible university, met some amazing people, had some great mentors there, got my C CPA, then got into management consulting. Um, and then, you know, I was off from there, but you know, just, I love this, I love this region. It's amazing. Uh, you bring up the whole temperature thing. My dad has always said that uh, growing up here, he's like, son, you're more resilient than most of the world. Because, you know, he's from Hong Kong, right? And it's usually really, you know, it's subtropic, right? Yeah. So it's warm year round. But he's like, in Edmonton, you go from minus 40 to plus 40. Yeah. And your body, you've grown up in that. So he's like, no matter what the world throws at you in the future, He's like, you guys are set. <laughs> totally. I, 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 you know, it's funny because I, I like, I see a lot of people talking about, you know, morning routines and you see this whole, whole health revolution, Andrew Huberman, yep. Peter Atia, they're talking about cold plunges <laughs> and meditation and, you know, get exposure to sunlight. Uh, my big health tip and health hack, health hack is to uh, live in Edmonton yeah. for a couple of years. Once you live in Edmonton, then you will build the grit and resilience because there is nothing like, you know, living in those extremes. And, and I, I just, yeah, I think it's important. That should be em Edmonton Economic Development's new tagline, right? Just yeah. build your grit, move to Edmonton. Yeah, just that, come, that's yeah. what you just come yeah, to Edmonton. Just come to Edmonton. Yeah, I, I think so. It's funny you bring up the uh, the ball hockey, street hockey. We, My friends and I used to do the exact same. We used to go to Londonderry Mall 
like 11 at night yep. with our cars packed with all the hockey gear and we'd set up like two rinks in the parking lot, right? Yep. You know, security was good back then. They're just like, yeah, you're not causing trouble. As long as you guys stay there, you know, just go for it. But yeah, that used to be like the evenings. You know what? I think, I don't know if it's like uh, Asian or South Asian culture, but like uh, ball hockey is the official sport of <laughs> South Asians yeah. in Canada. And part of the reason is because we, you know, our parents uh, perhaps couldn't afford, you know, traditional hockey. Um, that wasn't part of the culture at yep. some point. Um, I So you don't see many South Asians excel in, in hockey, yet there's so many South Asians that play ball hockey. If yeah. you look at any ball hockey league, it's like, it's it's there's so many South Asians. Yeah. And yeah, we just grew up playing street hockey and ball hockey, and that was just part of our culture. Yeah. And I, I, I'm surprised that there's not like, like ball hockey is not in the Olympics because it's such a it's such a democratic um, you know anybody in the world can play ball hockey yeah. you just need a stick and a ball and, and some people you yeah. don't need a rink you don't need skates you don't need a, yeah, yeah. You know, weather to make it happen so yeah I, I just we just love playing ball hockey yeah so I want to shift you know from you know your background now to the stuff you're doing well right? listen I, I appreciate you getting the book and by the way this is this i i didn't i didn't bring this <laughs> yeah, by the way i didn't bring this i, I bought that this. up that, i bought this <laughs> I, I appreciate that no, i read means, through this uh, it it's amazing because wow. it speaks to me <laughs> like a lot of things you reference in there i'm like that was me um interesting i was so before incredible so i've been doing this for two years now I've, i i say i'm like a a born again entrepreneur. Yeah. So I spent 10 years running my own consulting firm in private equity. Then I left. I decided to go back into corporate and I ended up joining Denton's, the large yep. law firm. I did that for four years. And and the entrepreneurial itch was just like, whatever. But during my time at Denton's, a lot of things that you were doing at Deloitte, I was like, yes. <laughs> Why didn't I read this earlier? Yeah. Why didn't I meet Sean earlier? Because it's, you know, it, it kind of validates some of the things that you're doing, right? You're like, yes, now, like, that's exactly right, right? You know, I took the risk, got a lot of flack for it at the beginning. And then, of course, when the results come through, you know, your supervisor like, well, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, see, we, we, did a, we did a good job, right, team, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, like, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm blessed. I mean, that that's why I wrote this book. I wrote this book for people like, for, for like, people like you that were working within organizations and trying to push the needle, trying to take small bets, trying to take small risks to move not only their career forward, but the organization forward. And I wanted somebody to read this book and I didn't want this book just to be for the entrepreneur, for the founder, for the creator. I really wanted this book to be for anybody. If you're like the finance manager, or you're the entrepreneur, um, somebody that can go off and say, hey, I can build my own world, my own universe, my own brand. Um, and get fulfillment around my work, yeah. working for somebody else. And I think that's incredibly important. Yeah. So, but why did you want to look into this? So this is a question I had for you. As I'm reading that, I'm like, this is great, right? This is speak to, speaking to me. But what really drove you to be like, I want to essentially put a roadmap together to identify, like not identify, to support the ones who want to be bold. Right? Yeah. Like, so what, what was the push for you to actually put this together? I think there's a couple of different reasons. Number one is that um, I see myself in this book. Uh, you know, part of the reason why I wrote this book is because I saw this, I call this this power shift that happens from uh, institutions to individuals. The idea that uh, today we have more power than ever, ever before, that mm -hmm. the individual has more power than ever, ever before. Yeah, yeah. And I saw that, you know, working for a very traditional organization that, you know, as I started to build my own brand, my own brand equity, create my, my, my own content, develop my own social network, develop my own, um, just sort of my own voice at the end of the day, I, I felt that that was able to garner me power in some sort of way mm -hmm. and by having your own power you can do almost anything whether it's within an organization or um outside of your organization and i said how do i write something where people can see that they have way more power than ever before so that's that that's the first reason the second reason is because um you know throughout my career i've helped organizations when it comes to this idea of innovation and disruption but i've always been fascinated about this idea of how are individuals disruptors? Right. One of my first speeches ever, actually the first speech that I ever gave on the topic of disruption 
was this uh, presentation on is Drake disruptive? That was the presentation. Yeah. And in that presentation, I dissected the idea of why Drake is a disruptor in his particular field of hip hop. And I, 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 you know, in the talk, I went through the entire thesis as mm-hmm. to why that is. Because I always thought that there were, there's incredible people uh, throughout history that really disrupted their own industries. And I've been so passionate and, and, and focused on figuring out how do they do it? How do individuals go off and do that? And I, if you look throughout history, the people that have changed the world have been individuals. And I've been fascinated by how one individual, one individual can change an industry, can change, um, you know, the world. Yeah. And I've been just so fascinated with that. And I want to write a book around how can we get more people to do that? Yeah. You know, one of the biggest examples, right, in the especially a technology space is Steve Jobs. Yes. And people always it's I don't know if you're a Mac or Windows user. I'm a Mac user. Yeah, I'm, I'm a and power Mac. User. Yeah, I just haven't got the Apple Vision Pros yet. I'm waiting. Yeah, it's not coming to Canada yet till yeah, later yeah, this year. Yeah. But yeah, I'll probably be getting that one. Um, but that's where the power of that individual has propelled the brand. I mean, Apple has a lot of things they do right, but like it was his push to be like, no, you need to focus on the details of even the littlest thing on it that provides that whole experience. And then the whole persona he created, the, what he wears to go on stage, right? Yep. And how he starts the presentations. And like it just, I would say, propelled Apple to become where it's at. It's 100%. Hundred percent. And although I don't write about Steve Jobs in the particular book, I mean he's he's a great example of somebody that basically personifies the organization. And let's mm. be honest, you, you know, you see other organizations like you know Tesla. Are you buying a Tesla because of the car? Or are you buying it because of Elon? I I would say that um, Elon is the product, and at the end of the day, and what I wanted to do with this book is to show people that they are the product. Right. That no matter what you are building, no matter what you uh, who you work for, you are the product at the end of the day. So how do you scale yourself? How do you have an impact? And you can build incredible businesses by you know lending your personality, your voice, your unique traits to whatever organization that you're part of. And so um, I really wanted people to understand again that they have way more power than ever before. And people like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. Um, are great examples of taking their own personality and applying it to these incredible organizations. Yeah. Well, but there is, so now on the flip side though, there's still a lot of fear from large organizations about individuals taking on, you know, more of their personal brand within the company. I think there's a good chunk of companies now willing to, you know, go along with this, right? Like, let's encourage this. Let's let our individuals build out their brand it's better for us as a company but i would say argue to say that there's still companies out there that are very uncomfortable oh i would say 95 i would say 95 percent of companies are uncomfortable with um individuals you know building their own power because listen that are the entire uh model of work today is based on this industrial era model where you 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 put a number on somebody's back and they're required to work on this assembly line and they've just been and that's actually that's actually modern work today we put a number on somebody's back and they are uh put on the assembly line the difference is, is that the assembly line now is just called you know finance hr <laughs> payroll yeah. procurement whatever it might yeah. be Right, we still work in an assembly line mindset, mm-hmm. and uh, going forward, people will recognize that individuals have more power than ever before. The idea that we have all the technology that we ever needed at our fingertips, um, I, I I I believe that you're going to see one billion dollar one person organizations at some point. I mm-hmm. said that back in 2019. Sam Altman just like mentioned that today because of. Uh, a couple of days ago because of AI. Like we have everything at our fingertips. We have all the media that we ever wanted. I mean, we're doing this pod, yeah, yeah. right? This this pod can go anywhere around the world. It can yeah. influence, it can create a narrative. Um, we have all the individuals that we ever wanted in the world. Like talent is ubiquitous. Just go to Upwork, go to Fiverr, go to Shepherd. You can go to any place and get the best talent. Yeah. All the software that we ever wanted is out there. Any APIs, apps, cloud is there. Generative AI 
ChatGPT, Bard, MidJourney. You're gonna have auto AI agents working for me for you. So like, what 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 is really stopping us? And I think the biggest realization that incumbents are gonna have is that not only are people built, not only should we let people build their own brand so that they actually, you know, stay with us mm -hmm. and you know at the same time build our own organization, but our competitors are not going to just be those traditional competitors. Our competitors are going to be like very small teams, yeah. maybe even one person. Yeah. Right. And that's a fundamental shift of how we look at the world. Yeah. And um, I think the best way to, you know, going back to your question about organizations, I think the best way to deal with people um, that are building their own brands is, is allow them to allow them to experiment, allow them to create their own, you know, brand identities. Uh, because that's just going to help you. Their halo is going to help you at the end of the day. And this is what we see in the NBA. You know, they call it the player empowerment movement. You know, yeah. LeBron sort of, you know, was the catalyst of that being, you know, his own brand. And, you know, the NBA and every team that he's been with has it really embraced that. And, um, you know, it's created an extraordinary revenue, not only for LeBron, but for the rest of the league. And I, I, I just see that that model is going to play out um, over the next decade and people are going to recognize how important their individuals are to their brand and to their broader organization. Yeah. Um, I like the part in your book where you're talking about your presentation. Uh, I, I think it was at Deloitte. Yeah. And you wanted to switch it up, change it up a little yeah. bit. And it, it reminded me, I, I had similar, I was working for a company and we we're raising capital for a project. And I picked up, I like I I would watch those uh was it the MacWorld presentations with Steve Jobs and I'm like, you know, you should we should be able to apply that to the investment world because in the investment world, presentations are like this, yeah. They have this on the PowerPoint up there, and the presenters always go okay so right and then they read it and you're just like oh my god and you're looking at the investors sitting there and they're like falling asleep and I'm yeah. like. I want to spice this up. This should turn into like an Apple presentation, but for investors. And I remember the first time I did it, the owners were like mortified. They were like, "What? You, like this is a you you we, you got to show us the presentations ahead of time." I'm like, "You gave me leeway, so this is what I'm." Gonna, they're like, "No, they're not, the investors didn't like it. Right? They you didn't give them enough information and stuff like that." What was interesting was the feedback from the people in the crowd at the end. Were like, that was the best presentation we saw about an investment. They're like, we actually remembered what you said yeah. compared. And so after that point, the owners were like, oh, okay, I guess we should maybe let Chris do his thing. So when I was reading about what you did at Deloitte, and I wanted you to talk a little bit about that because it's a huge fit and that was a big company. Yeah. And so I'm assuming the hurdles you or the, the push you had to just to convince someone, hey, let me do this. Like I'm assuming a big company, they've got their templates got to stick with those templates you got to be on brand you know i think i think one of the uh advantages is, is uh just being from edmonton you kind of you're able to run your own you you, you don't have as many people sort of you don't have to like mm -hmm. ask for blessing mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. so many people um you know i was always passionate about presentations i was always passionate about how do you persuade somebody to take action at the end of the day yeah. so i started my career um I used to work for a company called Singapore Press Holdings in Singapore. And my job there was to be like, they're like media strategists, figure out what like the future of newspapers would look like. And my job there really was to like create these like compelling uh, PowerPoint presentations so that we can, <laughs> so we can convince, you know, the, the, the folks around us to take action around the future of newspapers. Yeah. And in Singapore, it's really interesting because Singapore and perhaps it's the culture that I work for. I, I work for a very Chinese um, bureaucratic uh, organization they wanted everything on the PowerPoint, just like how you said, yeah. right? And so I, that's how I thought presentations should be. Right. Um, and, but I would still sort of add my own flair to it and make it, make it pop, make it colorful. Um, but you know, when I came over here, uh, I feel like we are a lot more, we, we are not driven as much about the, uh, you know, we're not driven by facts we're more driven by emotion at the end of the day. We're driven by story. And I don't think anybody remembers any of the facts. I don't think, I, and now that I know, now that I've done a thousand presentations and now that I've put together a thousand, you know, 10,000 like PowerPoint decks, I put my 10,000, you know, hours in. <laughs> um, I realize more and more that people forget everything. 
they don't remember anything. Mm -hmm. You will do a presentation, they will not remember. I don't care how good it is. They're going to forget 99% of it. And the things that you put on the screen don't matter. What matters is your story. What matters is the, what the, the feeling, the emotion that people have around it. So we get so romantic about the things that go on the slide. And I saw this at, at Deloitte. We get so romantic about what, what happens on the slide when really our job is to drive action at the end of the day. Right. And the only way to drive action is to tell better stories and to draw that emotion. Um, and so, you know, I, I just believe that the best way of do, doing that is not only through just like your PowerPoint deck, but through other means, whether it's through video, mm. right? Or whether it's through a website or whether it's through like an immersive experience. It's, it's looking presentation and uh, looking at a traditional presentation and looking at, at that in fundamentally different ways. How do we persuade somebody to take action? Will be someone be persuaded by a piece of paper or will they be persuaded by a video with a, a great narrative behind it? Right. Or um, you know, a website where it's interactive and it's beautiful and it's awe-inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, a great example of this is, I remember I was working with a a young junior consultant. It's funny, I just ran into him in the airport uh, a couple of days ago. And um, I taught him something uh, which I think anybody can take away from. He, he, he did this PowerPoint deck and he presented this really great content to the client. And the client was like, no, we, this is not working. This, th what are you talking about? This is not what we said it, and, and this is not gonna work. So he came to me and said, hey, man, I've been working on this for like weeks. I thought this was what they wanted. Like, this is what they said. I'm like, listen, the content is really great, but the way that it is structured and, and delivered is not the way that um, they want to receive it. Mm -hmm. So why don't we work on the aesthetics of this and reformat it to a way that is beautiful and awe-inspiring and, and, and aesthetically pleasing? Don't change the content. But right. change the format and the delivery of the content. So that's exactly what he did. We we changed it. We added you know more 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 storytelling, more graphics around it. Same content. Yeah, yeah. We redelivered the same content with a different format to the client, and they're like, they loved it, mm. right? And that was like, dude, you just you see like how much we are driven by aesthetics. We we just we love to receive something that has effort and that is beautiful and awe-inspiring. And that was a click for me. I mean, I already knew that, but that was another click for me to be like, I can teach this to say, how do we make things just, you know, look better? Yeah. And so that's why even from a personal brand perspective, if you go on the internet, you will not find a video, a single video, of thousands of videos of me across TikTok, LinkedIn, mm -hmm. YouTube, whatever. You will not find a single video that looks like shit. Mm. It will always be high quality. There'll always be multiple cameras. It will always be like a beautiful DSLR. It yeah. will always be well shot. The audio will be great because I'm trying to create a uh, a level of you know brand consistency. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to create a, a you know a, a reputation, and I just know that when you put an effort into something, and when something looks good and feels good and is is it told very well, yeah. that the value and meaning that you are trying to deliver, it just lands a little bit deeper. Right. It, 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 it just so much more important. And I, I, I feel like we forget that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I've got so many more questions about the book itself and, and your special and kind of your, but before I dive into that, I want to talk about the process of putting the book together and then we'll talk about Apple TV as well. Um, but walk me through about like your experience in putting this book together. Probably the, no, definitely the hardest thing that I've ever done in my entire life, which is putting a book together. Um, number one is like, I've always had this idea of putting this book together. I, in fact, the the original um, pitch to my literary agent around the title of the book was GOAT, which was greatest of yeah. all time. Um, and then, you know, over the years, um, as I continue to write it, and then I, when I got to the actual publishing process, um, the the book title changed. It used to be actually called The Dangerous Ones. And then my publisher, McGraw-Hill, they were like, we don't like Dangerous Ones. You got to change it to Bold Ones. And I know my book is called The Bold Ones, but I had to bend. I, or my, I know my, you know, I know this is all about being an innovator, yeah, disruptor, yeah, yeah. but I bend it. And I was like, okay, this is my first, you know, deal. 
I got a I got to change so it to you the wanted bold dangerous ones, ones. That yeah was, I wanted that dangerous was, yeah, ones yeah, yeah and actually I'm happy with that that they changed it to the bold ones okay. because I think I love the idea of bold mm-hmm. and I love the I love the yeah I love the word bold and it it, it actually it actually reinforces the same message, but it it doesn't do it in a scary way. Yeah, and I think um, so. I, so I do love the, the the change at the end of the day. But anyways, getting back to the process, um, I basically wrote a a pitch to my literary agent back in 2018, 2019. Um, and then he gave me some feedback. I went away. Not until 2021 did I get back with the literary agent and say, "Hey, I'm ready." To, oh, okay. to to go forth, uh, we we worked together on this proposal, this book proposal for months. Uh, Connor X, shout out Lucinda Literary, best literary agent that you could have, and we we put this amazing proposal together. We w- what happens at that point? You pitch it to a number of different public you know publishing houses, mm-hmm. and you know then you, they go through an auction, they go through a bid of mm-hmm. who they you know, of how much they want to offer in terms of their events and whatnot. Yep. And I ended up choosing McGraw Hill because of their, um, just how long they've been around for. And I really love the the editor that was a part of that. Her name was uh, Cheryl Segura. And she really dig, dig the book and she, she was excited about it, passionate about it. And then um, that was, we signed the deal in November, 2021. And then, uh, we had about five months to to go off and and just like finish it off. And so I already had a whole bunch of pieces um, before that, but you know it was a sprint in those five months to to get it done. And then you know multiple editing processes, the the publisher going through it, going through the audio book and whatnot. And then finally, when it came out, like the manuscript was due April twenty twenty two, but it didn't come out until December twenty twenty two. So, um, so yeah, then it was out in the world. So that that's the process. It's super long. It took a lot long time to write. A lot of it was on the plane. A lot of it was like late hours. But yeah, uh, yeah we got but it. But it, it is a process though, right? And I think a lot of people may need to realize that. I think with social media sometimes, and I talked with uh, Lynette Tremblay on my last podcast as well, and um, my um, and Leah Tolton as well, that you know, for her, it's been a 40-year investment in her legal career. Mm. And she said she sees it with a lot of young lawyers that it's like, because you see social media and you're like, overnight success, I got the Lambo, right? Like, check this out. I've been posting for 10 months and I have a Lambo. And it's almost this false narrative. And, you know, kids go, oh, that's just 10 months of posting. I'll get my Lambo. And then they do it. And they're like, I didn't even earn a dollar totally off my content. So I I want to ask you this because I want to put that reality back into people's minds. Like, there's a process to this. Yeah, and take your time because, as you said, like you you have a certain level <laughs> that you want to bring out there, and you don't want to just throw your book together and hey, let's just get this pro- published and say I did it in twelve months. Well, I, I I think anything that is great takes time. Yeah, and anything that requires mastery takes years, takes centuries. So I love the idea of the idea that it takes you know forty years for you know this to to, to cook. Right. This took years in the making. And I know like ChatGPT right now could like recreate this within seconds, which is which which is the truth. It could. Um, and it there is something to be said about a book that takes time, that takes research, that takes and then it's here. It's in front mm-hmm. of us, right? Mm-hmm. And that you can see the effort. Like I, I feel like we we uh just as human beings, we see when something takes a lot of effort yeah. when it takes a lot of time a lot of love and when you put something together like a book that is well written uh with with a ton of amazing stories you can tell there's a lot of time put into this thing yeah and um that just translates into something that's greater value and meaning when you see some somebody with a lambo on ig you 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 i i actually think that we you don't actually associate that as being something that uh is and maybe they did spend a lot of time like, yep, working away, yep. right? Yep. But you know, there's a lot of fakery when it comes to yep. social media, right? Um, I call it kayfabe. You know, you know, in wrestling, there's like this interesting idea of kayfabe where uh, you know that wrestling is fake. Yep. They know that you know that it's fake. Yeah. Yet they still play it out like it's real. Yeah. Um, and we have a genuine reaction to the yep. to the actual match. The same thing happens with social media. It's like we're putting together this highlight reel on social media where we kind of know, 
we know that you know that this may not be totally real, yeah. yet we still put it out and people still have a genuine reaction to it. It's yeah. like kayfabe. It's it's real. It's real, but it's fake. But it's it's kind of in between. So, um, anyways, all this to say, this is real, <laughs> and a book is real, and I'd people see the effort. I play a lot with uh, chat GPT and stuff, right? Because, you know, it's new tech. I want to play around with it. And I will say in its current format, it wouldn't be able to pump out. No, <laughs> The no, feel that no. you have, like, you know, the what you've written in there, right? It's very genuine. It, yeah, chat GPT at this point yeah. in 2024 point, yeah. is, you know, you, you, you don't want to read something from chat GPT. Yeah. You don't want to look at anything from chat GPT or anything that's built by generative AI. It takes the average. It takes the mediocre. Yeah. This is trying to like string, you know, pull at your heartstrings. It's trying to give you something that's compelling, that's engaging, that's interesting. Um, and right now, chat GPT can't really do that. Yeah. Um, I've got a lot of questions for you about AI as well, because I know that's been a big topic at your speeches and yeah. stuff. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, now I want to ask about Apple, the, uh, the special on Apple TV. Um, yeah, it's in Prime in the US and, and other places too. Yeah, yeah, I tried looking at I have a Prime subscription. I was like, oh, I'll just... It's Prime in the US, yeah. Yeah, I was like, ah, oh, it's not here. Um, but I did watch the, the Apple one. And how was that? How was that process of well, getting on Apple TV? I, I, I think it was equally as hard as getting the book. Okay. Um, and I think, you know, part of the reason why I did it is because it is hard. Um, very few people on the planet can do, actually a lot of people can write a book, yeah. but a very few, very few people can get a special. Um, I've always had this like, dream of having a special on a streaming platform. My idea was that, you know, I'm in this world of management thinking, and I don't think there's many people on the planet that have done this. Like, I think the only other example is somebody like Brene Brown. She's got a special mm -hmm. on Netflix and Amazon Prime. And um, I always saw that these comedians, you know, they, they always had these the these streaming specials, and you know, they were able to sell out their own sort of concerts and 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 sell their own dates. But I always felt that, like back in the day, the philosophers were the real rock stars, the people with mm -hmm. ideas, the people yep. that were changing people's behavior and taking action. Like those are the real rock stars. Yet right now we're relegated to like you know podcasts. Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, no, no offense, but I you know. Uh, but we, we I, I believe that we can elevate the, the the whole concept of ideas and getting people to change. And so having a streaming special would be my foray or my experiment to say, hey, like we should be elevating this field of, of management thinking. And, uh, you know, the process of putting it together was a bit wild. You know, I got my team at Bad Films, like we watched a whole bunch of comedy specials mm -hmm. and we watched Brene Brown special to see what that would look like. Um, and then... You know, we set a date. We set a date in in August of 2022, like six months before. Uh, you, you know, we had to pack the theater. We, you know, we had to develop the concept. We had to get all the production, um, you know, together to make that happen. I I I called it a pre book launch. I don't mm. even, I don't think people even had a pre book launch, but right. it was uh, um, what I wanted to do is like drop the special at the same time as the book. It didn't actually happen because I didn't realize the the how hard it was to sell it, and. Um, I think that was the hardest part. It's not. It's not only shooting the special, but it's also like g selling it and 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 like going through the insurance and then lawyers to make sure that you know everything checks the box. My first four into media entertainment, so it was a huge long process. But we finally got it out like basically a year later after we shot it. Oh, okay. And um, you know it was great. So and 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 it was a it was an amazing learning experience. I gl I'm glad that I got it out in the world, and it just it fueled me to say, okay, how can we do the next one even bigger and better? Yeah, I was just going to ask you, is there another one on tap or on deck? Absolutely. I, I, I think um would love to do it bigger and better. Would love to make sure that it's, um you know, way more uh, different than somebody's ever seen. So absolutely, it's it's on the it's on the it's on the bucket list still. Nice. Um, I want to dive back into the book here. And most of my listeners are professionals. So lawyers, accountants, financial planners. And a lot of them have been in the business for a while. And one of the things that I've seen working at a large law firm are the ones, the lawyers, the partners that succeed are the ones that are willing to try something different. So Heather Barnhouse was a partner at Denton's. She was the one and only partner that took me up on this idea of podcasting at Denton's when I first joined there. And she's like tripled her book of business. She's been asked to sit on a lot of boards. So she credits a lot of what she's done on the podcasting side to build her builder practice and but I see a lot of you know called mid-level partners and they they get in this routine and they get you know the, I don't want to say complacent but they're used to just doing it that way and they're not 
pushing that envelope, right? They don't want to give podcasting a try, Chris, whatever. I'm happy the way it is. In your book, you talk about this Russell Westbrook trap. And I feel that a lot of professionals get into that <laughs> Russell Westbrook trap. And I want you to maybe talk a little bit about what that trap is and then kind of your experience in how people don't get into that trap. Yeah. So Russell Westbrook is one of my favorite players in the NBA. He is somebody that approaches the game with ruthlessness. He's athletic. He 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 plays, he shows up every single day. Yeah. And that's why I love Russell Westbrook. And the reason why I wrote this idea of the Russell Westbrook trap is because he was traded from team to team to team. Uh, and part of the reason why he was traded is not because he he didn't show up. Is it, 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 the reason why he traded was traded was not because he wasn't great like as a as a as a player it's that when the environment shifted when the game shifted when the nba shifted in terms of what they prioritized in terms of a player um he couldn't adapt his own style mm. to that that current game and i i see that all the time within organizations and by the way the the punchline is that actually russell brusbrook over the last couple of years He's been willing to take a back seat. He's been willing to sit on the bench. He's been willing to be a leader. And a leader to me is saying, maybe the current style that I'm working in maybe doesn't work. And I've only seen that growth over the last like couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I, and, and I, as somebody that wrote about Russell Westbrook in this book, I, like that is in, incredibly inspiring yeah, yeah. that he's been able to do that. But I see this all the time with leaders that they are they are unwilling to take a step back and say, hey, where is the market going? hey, um, wh how do we do things differently? Even though that they're still great at what they do, but the environment has changed around them. And I think we get trapped with our own identity at the end of the day, mm -hmm. our own seniority, our own knowledge, our own um, title, our position. Our si like we don't want to get you know come off the bench. We don't want to um, you know learn from other individuals that are outside of our you know expertise. Like we. We, we become trapped with our existing identity. And I, what I wanted to do in this book is highlight how people get trapped and it happens in every single organization, in every single industry. So how do we, how do we break free from that? How do we break our own status trap? How do we break our own identity so that we can take on a new identity, to take on a new challenge, to accept new ideas that are coming in? So that's the Russell Westbrook trap. You know, you talk about status too, and culturally, especially on... In, in in the Chinese culture, status is huge. And yes. It's hard to give that up, right? Like there's a certain like almost push that status comes first. Money, status, right? You got to keep that. And like, that's why disruption is hard, right? Yes. Like I look at my cousins who are, you know, born and raised in Hong Kong and like they look at the stuff I do and they're like, we would never do that. Like, are you crazy? Right? Yeah. Like, you know, and, and it's like, I got to follow the rules. This is the five steps at the firm. Like don't, don't go out of that, right? Yeah. Um, I paid really well as a manager because I follow the rules really well, right? Yeah. Like disruptors don't work <laughs> yeah. in yeah. certain cultures. Well, you know what? I I am absolutely obsessed with the idea of status. I believe that actually my next book is going to be centered around the idea of status and how status drives innovation. Mm. Um, but to me, status um, is actually hardwired into us. We are hardwired to, to think about status, to even subconsciously think think about status, it's hardwired in everything that we do. Many people think status is something about being rich or wealthy, but status is really about how do you feel valued at the end of the day? Um, and to me, that's what status is all about. And I feel like um, the reason why people don't wanna innovate or they don't wanna try something new, it's because it will impact their own status. It's going to impact their seniority or their title right. or their their position or their identity. The reason why people don't want to go, they people want to go up the mountain, but God forbid that they go down the mountain. Right. It's in the book I write about the idea that actually going down in status is one of the hardest things that you can do as a human. That you would rather like rather like face death than to go back in status, to get right. demoted, to uh to, you know, to to lose your particular um standing in in society. And so um, I believe that the best way of even so that we know, we know that status is hardwired in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. I think the best way is to chip away at your status. So 
let's say I have built a career in this legal space. How do I go back down the mountain and say, how do I start something new, a new challenge where I start at the bottom of the mountain again? How do I start a new, uh, you know, advise a new legal startup, which I have no idea how to do, yeah. but I'm going to start at the bottom again. How do I start building content mm -hmm. when I know nobody's going to watch it? It's going to get zero views and that's going to hurt my ego. Yeah. How do I start that anew and start a new challenge? That's a way of, of challenging your status because you're actually inherently starting something new, which actually puts you at the lowest status rung, mm -hmm. right? The other way is actually to, you know, place yourself in lower status situations. Get the coffee, do the meeting minutes, come off the bench. By placing yourselves in these situations, you will automatically sort of disrupt your status. The reason why status exists in the word status quo is because that is, that's actually the thing that holds us back. And if you want to disrupt your own status, you have to disrupt your own. Uh, if you want to disrupt the status quo, you have to dis disrupt your own status. Right. Your own, the, the reason that made you successful. And the reason why, you know, we get complacent is because we, we uh, you know, it, it becomes part of our identity. Mm. And, 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 and I, 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 un, I fundamentally believe that the greatest, most addictive drug on the planet is comfort. And the more that we come comfortable, the more we sink into this identity that we're presenting to the world. But if we can shake that and disrupt that, that's how we get away from the status trap. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, by the way, on the Sedona status, I believe that status can be a great source of good. Like it's the reason why we want to innovate. The mm -hmm. reason why we want to innovate is because somebody did something that created value. I want to do that too. Somebody got this incredible position and I want to do that too. Status can be a great motivator as well. Mm -hmm. And so we have to like be able, it's such a powerful wor world, a uh, word, and it's such a, uh, uh, such a powerful concept that it could be our downfall and part of our greatest wins. I was just going to ask you that because you're saying potentially that could be the you know precipice of your next book. Um, but yeah, how do you turn that, right? Like on one hand, you just said status, right? Often keeps us down, but you're right. Like there is a different angle to status and how that could catapult innovation and get people well, to- le Let's look at how status has actually created some of the best tech companies in the world. Yeah. So Uber started by focusing on a elite group of individuals black cars in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And after that, they expanded from there. Status. Harvard, I mean, uh, Facebook started by focusing on one school, Harvard. You needed a Harvard email to sign up. Yeah. Status. Uh, so all these tech companies, I mean, if you look at TikTok, for example, the, the reason why TikTok really blew up is TikTok understood that, listen, we know that on Facebook and Instagram and, and, and Twitter that people have their own lands, mm -hmm. right? To, to gain upward mobility in terms of status on those saturated platforms, it's going to take a lot for a new person to do that. Yep. So why don't we create a new land and so that there are new people that come onto this platform and say, hey, why this is another way for us to create status, mm -hmm. to gain upward mobility. And what they did was, which was really interesting is that they, they promoted a certain number of influencers right at the get that had, you know, very little following, but they 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 almost pushed them. The Charlie yeah. Charlie D'Amelio's the um of the world, and they got this incredible status. So, so people were like, wait a minute, they have followings. Maybe I can do that too. And what TikTok is actually amazing for is that somebody with absolutely no following can actually garner an incredible amount of views and, and likes and, and and views with no following. They actually give people that lottery to to get status. Right. In what world do you get this other than a lottery yeah. where you can just leap yourself into this upward status? Mm. And so this is how they grew TikTok, yep. right? So all these, they use these mechanisms when it comes to status in order to grow. And um, if we look throughout history, that's always been the case. One of the in um, uh, one of the most powerful um, concepts within the Roman times was this idea of the Roman triumph. The Roman triumph was when the successful general 
would parade down the street in spectacular fashion. They would they would show up all the spoils of war, gold, exotic animals, rare objects. Mm-hmm. It was an incredible parade. The 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 Roman Empire would put on these parades and they would just be it it would be for the generals and it would be the day that bestowed the most status in society to those generals. So imagine like this was the Super Bowl. So you can imagine so many kids they're in this parade. And yeah. they're watching these generals get paraded down the street. They're right. getting everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason why the Roman Empire was so success so successful in my mind is because that Roman triumph, other kids saw that and said, Hey, I want to do that too. I want to get that parade. It's the same reason why, you know, the 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 NFL, the NBA, they do these parades. Other kids are looking at that and be like, hey, I want to, I want an I NBA championship. Yeah. I want to be, I want to go to the Super Bowl. It's status drives so much of our ambitions at the yeah. end of the day. And uh, yeah, it's just it's, fascinating. It's funny because there there are a lot of very highly p- paid athletes that haven't won like, let's say, a Stanley Cup. And you ask them and they're like, oh, you know, and you're like, yeah, but you made a lot of money. It doesn't matter. Yeah. That status of lifting and hoisting that cup for them, right? It's that's. That's what it's they everything. want. Yeah. That's why they'll go to, they'll sign for another team, maybe for less money. Yeah. Knowing that maybe my likelihood of getting that, you know, cup's going to be that much closer. Yeah. And, and it's funny because we also evaluate players based on, you know, if they won a championship yeah. or not. Right. Yeah. So it, it, it goes, you Look know, at their of, stats. How many, you know, how many goals did they score? Right. Yeah. Connor McDavid's going to, you know, surpass Gretzky maybe. Right. So status is embedded in almost everything that we do. And we just have to recognize the, the power in that. And, and to be honest with you, when it comes to something like, if we look at something like wealth, um, you know, what is wealth? Like who is wealthy? Um, I, I would argue that the way that we look at wealth is if you have, more money than somebody else. It's not like a. It's not like an organic. It's not like mm-hmm. a, a a completely uh, organic thing that I have enough wealth. The way that you know that you have an, enough wealth is to compare yourself to somebody else and like actually I'm wealthier than that person, so I have more wealth. Yeah. It, it it's really that's just it's it's really strange. Um, I want one more thing about sports because this one I it brought back old memories the vince carter effect oh about yes your yeah because i remember as a young kid because i used to like i i i'd get prepared to watch the uh nba skills competition the dunk, dunk competition right yeah. everybody loved it and that year that vince carter was in it oh i just i and you know you don't have uh back then i i may have had a vcr i didn't hit record though yeah, and so I would stay up all night watching TSN highlights. I'm like, I gotta see this again. Yeah, and it was so funny because I was I was watching on on YouTube. I was like, let me just look at the clip again. And I don't know if you were a Shaq's reaction. Yeah, yeah. He had yeah. the good old camcorder. Cam yeah, nobody had phones back then, right? No. So he's got the cam. He's like, ah. So it brought back a lot of memories about it. But you talk about this Vince Carter effect and cultural disruption because I would say, as much as Michael Jordan, right during his era, during his era when he was in the skills competition, he brought a, the dunk competition to a whole, whole new yep. level. But Vince Carter, I don't know what, like that. that's like stratosphere, right? Yeah. So MJ took it here, Vince Carter took it here. Yeah. Because that even non-basketball fans, I remember the next day going to school, who's this, like, did you watch this guy? Like, he's like, it's a, a dunk competition or something? And like, they never watched basketball. They're all of a sudden talking about basketball, right? They're talking about Vince Carter. Yeah. Talk about the Vince Carter effect. So I believe we take for granted the power of that moment. To me, that Vince Carter moment was the most powerful cultural event for Canadian basketball ever. Even though Vince Carter is not Canadian, he played for the Raptors. Uh, Even though the game of basketball was built by a Canadian, James Naismith, even though we've had amazing Canadian players like Steve Nash. Yep. That pierced the culture because what he did was so awe-inspiring, so audacious, so remarkable in that dunk competition that he literally froze the world over. And my, I, I believe that there are literally so many Canadian basketball players in the NBA because of that moment. You have Shea Gilgis-Alexander, you have RJ Barrett, you have... Uh, Andrew Wiggins, 
uh, you know, Jamal Murray, all these incredible basketball players. And part of the reason why they are incredible basketball players today is because when they were a kid, they they saw that. Yeah. They pointed to that and be like, wow, like he's from Toronto he's from the Toronto Raptors. Yeah. Like that that's our team, right? How many kids went off and like tried to replicate those dunks? Those are dunks. This is like pre-social media era, right? Yeah. You, I don't think you could like recreate that today because of a, like just the the influx of information and content that we're getting every single day. Like that was pre-social media. It was so awe-inspiring that it pierced the culture. And the reason why I want to write that in this particular book is that because when many people think about disruptors, they always think about technological disruptors. Mm -hmm. But I believe that there's a new world of cultural disruptors, people that literally pierce the culture. They change the game, of not just because of technology, but because of they did something so awe-inspiring. In the book, I talk about the idea of you know what Shakespeare did for writing, what Mahanda, Mahatma Gandhi did uh, you know for the peace movement, um, or what Vince Carter did for Canadian basketball. You don't have to be a disruptor just through technology. You can one person can create an impact just by doing something so remarkable that it changes, you know, how we even look at the world. And I think what Vince Carter did for Canada for basketball was just absolutely incredible. I remember that moment and I remember my brother, we didn't watch it live because we were at our cultural event, um, but we, we we were excited about it because we, we, we knew that Tracy McGrady and yep. Vince Carter, they were gonna put on a show and actually Steve Francis was in there and, as well. And we knew it was gonna be amazing. And when we came home, I mean, we watched that so many times. <laughs> yeah. I, I I think the, the tape got yeah. burned almost <laughs> yeah. because we watched it so many times. It was incredible. It's not only that one dunk, but he had a he had like three or four or five dunks that were just absolutely incredible. I like how you brought that up that it, it doesn't have to be through technology. And I think that's kind of the gist out of all of this, right? No matter what industry you're in, doesn't have to be in Silicon Valley, doesn't have to be in tech, there is a way for you to disrupt the culture of that industry. Yeah. And I think that's hugely impactful. Yeah. You know, in the book, I I, it's, it, I don't even talk that much about technological disruptors. It's, it's really about, um, you know, cultural disruptors. And I think we get really romantic about this idea of, yeah, technology and disruption when yeah. really you can change the, you can change your game by doing something remarkable, whether it comes to your brand or your customer experience or how you, apply your processes or just changing some way of doing doing things not necessarily around um technology and i just feel like um yeah th th there are there are so many examples throughout history where people have like disrupted their game through through different means yeah sean i can talk with you for hours <laughs> we have a lot in common but i do thank you for joining me on this podcast uh before i let you go uh, I've been doing this for my new season of podcast now. Um, so my media company that we started is called Convos Media. And so the, the gist of it is having authentic conversations and applying that again, same thing, whatever industry you're in, I think communication conversations is what drives progress. What minimizes, um, you know, clients getting mad at you, right? <laughs> Things like that. I think it comes down to communication. hundred percent. Conversations. So my question for you, and I didn't prepare Sean for this. Um, if you had an opportunity to chat with someone, have a genuine conversation with someone, dead or alive, who would it be? Wow. Great question. Um, you know, I think I would pick my father because my father died um, 2008. I was like 23 years old. Okay. And... I, I'll give you another answer after this because, uh, you know, it's interesting, but like what was remarkable for me is that my father only knew me as a kid. He never knew me as like an adult. Mm. He never saw anything that I actually, he never saw my, he never saw my wife. He never saw my kids. Yep. He never saw me write a book. He never saw me do any of these things. Yeah. Like what an incredible conversation it would be now to have him with my father and to to see what he was thinking during that time. Or, you know, I think one of the beautiful things about society today is that now everything is recorded. We're having these conversations and my, my, my kids can co come back and see what, what, what did my father say when he was 39 years old? What, 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 was, he, what was he thinking yeah, yeah. at that time, 
right? I didn't, ha- we don't have that. We don't have that. We yep. can't see what our father was thinking at 40 years old. Yep. Like I would have loved that. I would have loved to see what his mindset was. So, you know, I, I go back to that because like, I, I find it, I think about it every single day that this guy, he raised these kids, but he never really saw the the fruits of his labor, um, which is, uh, yeah, which is uh, disappointing. I think um, one of the other people that I would probably um, highlight in the book, I hi- like one of my favorite stories from the book is uh, a pirate. Her name is Xing Shi. She is a uh, one of the most remarkable people that you will ever hear about. This this woman grew up in a basically in a floating brothel. Mm-hmm. She was a prostitute. She was a flower flower boat girl in China. She became a flower boat girl and became one of the most powerful pirates of all time. Mm-hmm. managing a fleet of 80,000 pirates across 1,700 ships. That's the size. 80,000 pirates is like the is the size of like Facebook today, okay? This woman managed this group of disruptors, innovators. She had a code of conduct. Um, she, I, and, and, and for me, I just, I, I want to know like how, how did you, how did you manage a group of like people that were rebels, misfits, who could care uh, less prisoners. about exactly rules? Eighty thousand people <laughs> marching in step and being one of the most successful pirates of all time. How did you do that? Yeah. So that's why I want to highlight her in her book, in yeah. this book. And guess what? She killed a lot of people. She was probably a terrible person, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, like. But I'm just fascinated with how she was able to do that. Yeah. So I I found that it would interesting. be your one and only conversation with her. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You'd be done. And 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 actually, there's no there's no like direct quotes from her. Nobody like she did never did a podcast. Yeah. She yeah. never did an interview. Yeah. So, and I researched the hell out of this right. for this book. Yeah. Every single book, every single piece of research, we went back to like Chinese uh, literature to see if we can find anything that she ever said. And couldn't find anything. Wow. And so I want to highlight her in the book. And like, if I would go back in time, I would definitely talk to her. It's amazing. Sean, thank you so much. I know you're on a busy schedule. So thanks for dropping by. The, listen, this the convo studio this, here. Listen, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm was excited to come here. I love what you are doing. So whether wherever you are watching this, like subscribe, like this, like thank share you. this out. <laughs> because, you know, you, you've been putting in the work and I love... You know, I talked about this idea of production and aesthetics. Like, obviously, you put a lot of time into it. Like, this intro for this po- for this for this set conversation was great. I didn't hear it yet, but I'm sure <laughs> it, it was amazing. Like, it you're, will put- be good. you're putting in the love, and that's why I want to come on. To be honest with you, because I love people that are not just winging it; they are putting in the love. And I will always, um, just yeah, just support people that clearly care about what they're doing. So, Thank kudos you. to you. Thank you, and make sure. Pick up the book. Yes. It's a good read. Thank it's you so much. It's a really so good read. And if you haven't caught the Apple TV special yet, go for it. You won't be disappointed. Thank you so much. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe and like button. Every little bit helps. Hit the follow button on whatever podcast platform you are listening to. Take care, and I'll catch you on the next episode.